the webinar is live. I don't know what that means for. Um, I assume that means every. You know, I'm hoping everyone can now see and hear us. Um, otherwise, I'm literally just talking to the. the three people I can see on my screen, uh, which would be very nice anyway. But assuming that there are 103 people out there um, uh, joining us for this uh, SMF Ask the Expert event, I will say welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us. Uh, to be clear, you're at the Social Market Foundation in virtual form uh, for uh, an Ask the Expert uh, event, which is uh, something we do in partnership with our friends at UK Research and Innovation. Uh, they, as you probably know, uh, fund uh, lots of academic uh, research across the UK, uh, which has the well, many benefits to the country. Um, and we do this work with UKRI uh, to help illustrate the, uh, the relevance, the impact of that UKRI funded work to policy and policy making and the way uh, the country uh, operates and uh, uh, proceeds towards its future. Um, uh, I am very lucky today to be joined by our principal speaker, um, who is Eje uh, 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 Ozdemirolu. Uh, uh, we've also got uh, Polly Billington from, um, where are you from, Polly? It's, it's got 100. UK 100. Uh, UK 100. I was going to say 100 UK, but that's the yeah. UK 100, which uh, looks at uh, climate change from a local uh, perspective. And then Matthew Pennycook, the shadow uh, minister for climate change from the Labour Party. Um, now in terms of uh, running order, we'll hear, first of all, from Eji, who has um, long and illustrious um, titles. I'll try and give you in a second. Um, uh, on our given topic of uh, the green and just recovery from COVID, uh, from from COVID nineteen, um, we'll hear from you from 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 Edry. Then uh, I'll have a, a chat with uh, with Polly and then Matthew about uh, their perspective on on that topic, on that you know, the, 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 you know, the the importance of the green recovery, uh, and then we will go to a wider uh, conversation with all of you. Uh, when you uh, want to ask a question, we've got the uh, we've got the chat. We have both chat and Q and A on Zoom, which never ceases to, to to confuse me. But you can use either of those um, those functions to indicate you would like to ask a question. Uh, I will keep an eye on those things, uh, and what we'll try and do is identify. Uh, uh, identify people for questions coming up, and then if you bear with us, then my colleagues who are lurking in the shadows at the moment. Um, Rhiannon and Hannah will uh, spotlight you and isolate you and bring you on camera if you'd like to ask your question in person. Otherwise, I can always summarize it for you. Um, just to be your know, final point, um, uh, if you look up in the top left hand corner of your screen, you'll see that we are recording this session. So it will remain live on our website afterwards. So just bear, mind, bear that in mind when we get to the question point um, that you are effectively talking to a, a public and broadcast event. Um, uh, I'll also probably give you, yeah, for people asking questions, you might find me nudging you towards actually ending the ending your question with a question as opposed to you know, sort of mini speeches. I, I, I like questions, not uh, not statements. Um, uh, so I think that's all the housekeeping you will hear from me. I will do my absolute best to shut up and not talk very much for the next uh, hour and 25 minutes because, uh, as always, I'm the least interesting person on these panels, which is why I enjoy them so much. Um, so without any further ado, I will um, uh, uh, go over to Eje, who, who will... Um, no, I'm going to try and do all this. Eje is the founding director of economics for the environment consultancy EFTEC, and also probably in a more pertinent sense, given recent government announcements and their imminent publications, uh, a member of the Adaptation Committee for the Committee on Climate Change, um, which I think will be producing quite a major report in is it next week, week after? Yes, on Net Zero. On Net Zero. Um, so, um, so that is Ajay, um, uh, who is talking to us about um, the, you know, or the, the essay question we set for you, I think, was yeah. uh, achieving a green and just recovery from the coronavirus crisis. So, uh, okay. Ajay. Thank you, James. Thank, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to share my personal reflections on what I've learned so far from the pandemic, but also cover um, at least some of the uh, Climate Change Committee's um, recommendations, especially for uh, recovery for adaptation. Um, 
I really have sort of four key messages and perhaps I'll start with that and expand on some of them um, in the 10 minutes or so that I have. Um, the first one is really is recovery is an opportunity for improving things and not going back to a baseline uh, or business as usual uh, where we would if we stay on that, we would increase risks of future pandemics and not be prepared for other risks that we might face in the future. Um, Bennett Institute of uh, University of Cambridge published a paper today on, on recovery um, and, and they have a phrase there which I really liked, so I'm going to, to steal it, um, but refer to it anyway, uh, is they say building back is not the challenge, it is building forward to something better. Um, and I think it's, it's very important to think about recovery as an investment opportunity, not as spending to encourage people to spend more in the short term, but invest in things, invest in capitals that will give us the ability to adapt to future challenges uh, but also invest in capitals that can keep on giving. Uh, so that's my first point. Um, it's an opportunity, it's an investment, it's not an expenditure. Um, the second point is really, is really we need to put idea, money into ideas that we already know are good ideas. We're not short of ideas. We have lots of lists and Boris Johnson came up with his 10 point plan. Um, Committee on Climate Change has made many recommendations, including a letter to the Prime Minister in May this year uh, of a, priorities um, for a, a green recovery. Many others have, um, many reports are coming forward um, and I think we, we do have, a, we can come up with a top list even in this webinar. But the key is to put the money, money into these investments um, and hopefully tomorrow there'll be some uh, recommendations or sorry, announcements about a national infrastructure or an investment back. I'm not sure exactly what it will be called um, and I think we'll, we'll touch upon that a bit later. Um, but the key would be is to use public money for public goods um, and use public money to accelerate green finance and green blended finance from all sectors in the country. Um, the third reflection is really as an economist, how can I be a better economist to help with the green recovery? Um, and I think this is um, very important to get the kind of boring analytical bits right to make better business cases for investing in recovery. How can we do that? We need to account for all benefits. This is not about financial returns. This is about all benefits in terms of health, in terms of well-being. We are capable. We have the analytical tools to measure these returns. We just have to take them seriously. Um, and we need to attach premiums for premiums to fairness. Uh, it is not just about sort of total benefits e exceed costs. If we have economists online, it is not about Pareto efficiency anymore. It is about really achieving, seeing the economic benefit in achieving fairness across society now, but also over time. Um, so again, maybe tomorrow we'll have some announcements on refreshing green book and I can talk to you more about if that's interest uh, in the perhaps Q&A. The final point I wanted to make is being aware that there are a lot of UKRI colleagues or other you know, generally research colleagues online, as I understand it. Um, and it, it's really important to, to recognize, I think, that the solutions do not right, right, rest in any one camp. You know, there is no all technological solutions. Yes, electric vehicles are good. Yes, renewable energy is good, but it cannot be just technical solutions like that. Um, we can't have just behavioral change solutions like people staying on their bicycles. We need to have systemic solutions that bring all of these things together. How will these things come together? They will come together through multidisciplinary research. And multidisciplinary research needs recognition in the academic world, but it also needs investment in it. And um, we have some work on showing that yes, multidisciplinary research is very beneficial, but it also takes longer for people to learn to work together. And uh, I hope research funders will be aware of that. Um, Really COVID, uh, just, just to say a few words, if I may, to expand couple, on a couple of those points. One is that I think pandemic has taught us what is important and that 
I am an environmental economist, so I do realize finance is not the only return to investments. But I think that that recognition that yes, money income is of course important, but its distribution is important. Um, also other things that make us happier and increases our welfare are just as important sometimes. Access to green space, equal access to green space is very important. Um, but when you look at the, the past business as usual, Yes, we've all recognized urban parks are very important for us during lockdowns, um, but last 10 years, urban green space has been in decline. Why is that has been in decline? Because we only notice it's the cost of its upkeep in our financial accounts, um, and we don't pay as much attention to all the health and welfare, welfare benefits you can generate for society by keeping them up. Um, so a systemic and analytical change is necessary. And COVID has not happened in isolation. It's not the only risk we're going to be facing in the future. Um, um, there will be other types of pandemics, perhaps, as we continue to degrade the environment and push the human existence against wildlife. David Attenborough did that fantastic documentary in October, you'll remember. Um, but Christina Figueres said, um, who was the ex-head of UN uh, Framework on Climate Change um, Convention, she said in April that COVID-19 is a time warp of climate change. So we will face climate change risks over a much longer period and we still think it's going to happen to somewhere else, someone else at some point that we don't have to worry, but we are actually already experiencing one, one and a half degree climate change. So we're already being affected by risk. So it's not just about recovery from COVID. If you take this opportunity, it's also saving costs from other risks and improving our welfare in the, in the mix. So just let me finish with a, a, a list of things that committee thinks would, we could invest in to make these things possible. These are low capital expenditure investments with high employment ratio and with financial and health and well-being returns. Uh, but to realize these returns, we do need to make systemic changes like um, not subsidizing things that we shouldn't subsidize anymore, for example, but supporting technologies that will help us. For example, a joint buildings policy that in ensures low carbon housing, but also ensures houses that are resilient to flood risk, resilient to overheating in the winter, sorry, in the summer, maybe in the winter, I don't know, under some scenarios, um, but insulation to reduce energy costs for people, um, to reduce um, health impacts and welfare impacts, but also are affordable. Um, investing in uh, nature, not conservation of um, designated species, but investing in water availability, in soil quality, in things like peatlands, so that they can do many things for us, capture carbon, regulate water quality, um, provide biodiversity, but also provide agricultural returns, sustain our agricultural returns, as well as lo lovely landscapes. Um, support each other to have better information on risks and adaptation opportunities. Not forget in investment in water efficiency um, and do all this across all departments. It is environmental priority when we talk about adaptation, we think it's a priority for environment, but DEFRA is definitely not the only government department that should be involved. It's all government departments in all walks of life and also leadership of government to encourage business to take note of risks. And there are many, many positive things that are happening, uh, but I'll stop there and maybe, maybe talk to you about what kind of positive things are happening at the same time that we mustn't forget. It's not all about risks, it's risks and very importantly, opportunities. Thank you very much. Um, and as a, yeah, yeah, as, as a uh, little forewarning, I suppose later on, I'm, I'm gonna come back to you on one of the words you said there, which was the word distribution, because um, I think that's a very interesting uh, question to explore here in that context of the just transition. But before I do, we, we'll, that will be after we've heard from our other, other speakers, starting with uh, Polly Blington from UK 100. So, Polly, I mean, can you, well, I don't know if you could give us a brief I said you, yeah, UK 100 brings brings together local, local leaders on, on on climate action. Could you could you give us a, a brief overview of the, I guess the local 
uh, the local perspective on this uh, on this issue. How yeah, well, more than 300 local authorities across the country have declared a climate emergency over the last 18 months. We've got 100 members of our network, uh, including about a quarter of those who are predominantly rural countryside um, uh, local authorities who know and recognise in relation to what Eche has said about adaptation um, and so forth, that they've got some particular challenges and also that they've got particular responsibilities in terms of preserving uh, important carbon sinks like peatland and so forth. But our, our network is about making sure that local authorities can learn from each other, where, the, the, where, the, the, where there is good stuff that is being done by uh, leading local authorities, but also create a platform for national change because frankly, we will not, the, U, the UK government will not be able to get to net zero by 2050 without a significant amount of local action led by local authorities. And unless and until they en enable local authorities to be able to use what powers that they have by actually having a national framework that facilitates and, and incentivizes net zero action, you're going to have perverse incentives where basically you stick with the business as usual, sloppy standards on, um, on, on new buildings, um, building in uh, carbon dependency in terms of transport, uh, failure to be able to, uh, to shift people to active travel, um, still shonky, drafty old buildings that aren't properly retrofitted, all of those things local government could deal with, right, and, and, and do a significant amount of change about. But quite often it's national frameworks that are getting in the way. You'll hear of local authorities who put in really high building standards and the National Planning Inspectorate comes along, rips them all out and says it's a drag on the market. Since when is it a drag on the market to facilitate greater ambition and allow the market to be able to hit greater standards. Those kind of things are happening all the time. So we need to be able to enable, we need to be able to make the case to national government that unless they, uh, they facilitate um, net zero action locally, remember the two biggest sectors that need to be decarbonized are transport and heat. And they happen in places. Why does transport and heat need to be decarbonized? Because we've done so much all right on so well on power. It's fantastic the Prime Minister keeps going on about offshore wind. But you can't offshore your transport. You can't offshore your heat. That actually has to be done in places. That's where the next big cha challenges will be. And that's where local authorities have a really important role to play. And in terms of I mean, our, our theme of the just, you know, the just transition, um, and I'm just thinking particularly, uh, Edry talked about this, this, this not being a policy area that exists in isolation, that there, there's, there's lots of other stuff going on. And uh, isn't that particularly salient to, to local authorities who, you know, while yes, you, you know, you've got your members who've signed up, they are committed, they have all those pressing issues. At the same time, if you're a local authority trying to cope with you know, the transformation of your local job market, uh, all the other first order consequences of a pandemic, uh, on whatever your budget happens to be within whatever framework you're operating from local, you know, from, from central government, um, I mean, how much time uh, and focus can local government actually give to this issue at the moment? Well, that's what's so interesting about the fact that the climate emergency declarations um, were happening before COVID. But actually, rather than seeing COVID a, as a reason to stop doing this stuff, most of our members have said this is uh, this is, uh, it, as you, as someone, some people have said, it's a, it's an opportunity to turn a crisis into a, into an, uh, into some change, and that's where they've been uh, pulling together. For example, the declaration um, that was that we convened via the Tar Resilient Recovery Task Force, asking for five things: a net zero development bank, seamless EV charging infrastructure, a government-led retrofit program that government-led but locally designed and delivered retrofit program, um, uh, suitable elements of uh, new powers as well, and of course the decentralisation and decarbonisation of the grid, because however much we've done on offshore wind, a lot of the next bits of the generation of energy have got to happen in places, and those things, those things, that will require a significant change again in the way that local authorities deal with their district distribution network operators. But like you say, James, you're dealing with a massive cut in your funding, a massive crisis where you're having to decide where you're going to put a mortuary if you have another spike in deaths, and you're still having to collect the bins and look after your vulnerable children. Those are the things that you that you're basically tested by locally. So if somebody like me comes along and says, "Oh, I'd really like to talk to you about planting trees," or 
fuel, knocking out the megatons of CO2 from your economy. You can understand if people will say, sorry, I'm too busy. What's been amazing about this is that the green recovery is absolutely what local authorities want to do. And can I particularly put it in the context of levelling up? There are two reasons why this is a crucial to the levelling up agenda. One is de-industrialised places need jobs, and this is a jobs-led opportunity here. And uh, Eche has already talked about the kind of multiplier effect of this kind of investment. There's also a really kind of, probably kind of quite mundane point, but where some there are some parts of the country where we had so much grid capacity because we had so much industry, and frankly, that industry has gone. If you want to start thinking about how you rethink the grid, you do it in places where you've got loads of grid capacity, where, you, where there used to be mines, where there used to be steelworks. Yes, of course, decarbonize your energy intensive industries to protect them and make sure that they survive. But where they have gone, this is places where actually not only do we need the social and economic leveling up by job creation, but we've also got a great opportunity to completely reconfigure our, in, in our industrial strategy. Thank you. I, I, again, I, that's definitely sort of I want to come back to this question of job, jobs and employment transition, I suppose. Um, but I, I'll, before I, well, I want to keep moving, so I should, well, well, final question for you, for you, Paul, before I go on to Matthew. But just, I mean, in terms of you, what you're describing there about the relationship between, uh, or, or you, well, implied in what you're talking about is, is, is the centrality of the relationship between local and central government. And you are, um, you, 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 you're, 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 you're a grizzled and scarred veteran of central government in a, in a previous life, <laughs> um, if I can be so charmless as to say it. Um, you, do you think that even though we have currently a, a government, a, a prime minister who, uh, and, a, and a legislative framework, which is committed to, you know, to net zero, is the the impetus behind the net zero agenda is that currently enough to overcome the the centralizing force of the british state that, yeah, well i would i would say that the 10 point plan suggests not because the 10 point plan had almost no reference to uh, local activity on this and like i say you can't get this done without local government you can't get it done without thinking about places and if you think about the way that people experience their own lives it will be is the road up in front of me going to be dug up three times or once am i going to be able to walk my children to school safely is the park at the end of my street going to be built on or is it going to be protected? All the things that HA, HA has talked about. And those are, those are most of those decisions are actually within the, within the gift ostensibly of local government. So national government has to really transform its, its relationship with local government. And this is not something that is new. OK, as you say, I'm gr grizzled and scarred from having spent time in Whitehall in the in the uh, in the late noughties. And uh, there was the, the 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 disdain which was held, which um, new Labour held local government in is is uh, is equivalent to what is uh, you experience now, except that perhaps the, the the relationship didn't entirely break down through things like austerity and, uh, and some of the crises around Covid. But they sort of like, well, if they were serious and they would be here. Is frankly the, is quite often the attitude of Whitehall civil servants to gov local government officials and elected politicians in uh, Westminster to people who are leaders in their local authorities. Those things have changed in relation because now we have dire directly elected mayors and the devolution agenda has grown, although we've seen that sometimes that has ended up with some kind of damaging relationships like we've seen recently. Unless Whitehall um, allows the penny to drop that local action is required for them to be able to meet their targets. And they need to have a grown up conversation with people who make daily decisions, which will make a difference. Then we will not meet our net zero targets. It's as simple as that. So change the relationship, understand that this is, like Eche says, this is an economic imperative and it's a political imperative. And I know we're gonna to come to this in the conversation that you're gonna have with Matt. We also require a political consensus so that yes, you can achieve your other values by doing net zero. And if you don't do net zero, your other values will be diff more difficult to achieve. And unless and until we frame it that way, then I think politicians will always say, well, that's a nice to have at the end of the day and it gets dropped off the agenda. Thank you. And you, you, you immaculately you know, you teed up my um, uh, my conversation with you know, with Matthew Pennington, the Shadow Minister for Climate Change. Um, and that, that's a very good place to start, I, I think, Matthew. Um, this question of 
I mean, you know, of consensus. I mean, you, bluntly, you're a politician. I'll, 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 I put it to you, sir. You are a politician. Admit it. You are a politician. But actually, on this issue, I mean, do you think it's fair to say that this is not as political a subject as some? Because while I know you have your differences with government, they, they aren't they, broadly speaking, uh, you know, your, your criticism of government is do, do, do this faster, do it more. It's, there is no fundamental political disagreement about, about net zero and decarbonisation anymore. Is that, is that fair? I think that's fair to the extent that we've legislated for net zero, James. So ostensibly, we all agree that it's the target. I mean, I think, I suppose where I push back slightly in, is that the difference between, you know, further and faster is the difference between realising that target and not. And so I think there is a fundamental difference as, as to whether you are prepared to do what is necessary. And as part of that, as Polly says, whether you're prepared to, you know, accept and embrace systems change and what you need to do in terms of how the British state works, how we bring people on board. One of the things that really jumped out for me from that 10 point package, I won't call it a plan, it's not a plan, a 10 point package was uh, not only were local areas not included people are entirely absent from it it's all about technology and that's an important part of it but we've got to take people with us and uh, we've actually got a debate on Thursday in the House of Commons about the UK Climate Assembly's report and I think there's important lessons there but and we can come to this if you like if, if you do bad green policy if you don't take people with you if people and communities across the country particularly those hosting infrastructure don't see the benefits of the transition we're going to get a kickback in a way that makes it that much harder and so I think, you know, in the sense further and faster is more, it's not a fundamental difference with the government in terms of the target, but I think the implications of it are quite significant. Um, uh, you know, and it's, I, I say that saying, uh, as someone who, said, who kind of accepts, you know, the fact that the, the prime minister, a Tory prime minister, given what we've had in recent years, is coming forward with a, a 10 point package that's very welcome. Any, we're in the midst of a climate and environment emergency. Any climate action is welcome. It's, a, it's an important signal, I think, that this government recognises it must be a priority. Um, but everything follows from, have you actually got that plan in place? Are you willing to do what's necessary in terms of the scale of, of the investment? And what worries me around the world, in fact, not just in this country, is a green recovery hasn't really, if you look at the details of, of what's happening in terms of, of investment flooding into fossil fuels around the world, a green recovery has not been a core part of most uh, recovery stimulus packages around the world. And I'd argue it really isn't a core part of ours. We'll see what the spending review says tomorrow. But at present, let's take the government's number and let's accept the government's number that was in the plan, 12 billion pounds overall, three billion pounds of new money in, in last week's package, although I can't going through that 38 page document, make it add up to three billion even. But let's say 12 billion overall, that is way short of what other uh, major economies that are really trying to push the envelope on this are doing. Germany, 42.8 billion euros, France, 35. 12 billion uh, doesn't get you where you need to get to. And the, when we look at that net zero investment gap, if you like, IPBR put it at 33 billion a year for the next three decades. PwC on the date the package was released put it at 40 billion a year. We're just not there. So I'd argue, yes, there's a consensus about the very, very long term target. That's not really the issue. The issue is, are you prepared to make the decisions now and level with the public about what needs to happen in this crucial decade? And uh, well, on that, you, 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 you preempted my next question as well. Everyone's doing, doing very well today. Thank you. Um, you, you, you talk about le leveling with the public. Um, I mean, and come back to Edge's word earlier on, distribution. Um, you, uh, and this is a slight devil's advocate question, so, so forgive me for it. Um, looking at this issue from from a from reasonable distance, I sometimes think that you know, politicians collectively are all at risk of sounding a little bit optimistic that the current message that you would take away from you know, the transition as a consumer, as a voter, as someone watching TV at home in the evening would be that this is all going to be great. It's going to make everything cheaper and greener and it's going to create some jobs. And I worry a little bit that what's missing from that conversation is the a slightly more realistic conversation with the electorate about the transitional costs. The fact that there are going to be upfront costs uh, that need to be allocated to someone, either bill payers or taxpayers. And it doesn't feel like we're quite talking about that yet. And there are going to be transitional 
you know, there are frictional costs in terms of employment. If you are currently working in a high, a high intensity, a high carbon intensity industry, it may well be that you, the job you're doing at the moment doesn't exist in the same way, shape or form in several years time. Um, and I don't know how much is being said to you about that. So it, do you have any worry that actually we're currently in the phase where transition sounds lovely, but as we get a little bit further down, down, the, low, down the road and people find out that you know, they need a new boiler or their car's going to you know, be taken off the road or their job may not, you know, their, their job may change or disappear, that actually there is a potential for you know, a little bit more political friction and tension there. There's, def there's definitely a uh, potential for friction if this is if this has got wrong. I mean, and we, we're seeing it across London at the moment in terms of low traffic neighbourhoods. There's definitely, this, <laughs> you know, this, this, uh, lots of the changes that need to happen uh, are very challenging. I think what I'd say is... Uh, for, 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 sorry, if I can briefly drop that, I'm not sure if you, for, for non-London non uh, yeah, London attendees, various local, local countries. Local, we do yeah, have low traffic neighbourhoods elsewhere, by the way. It's really? just that the only stuff that gets reported on in The Guardian is in London. They've successfully done them in Newcastle, they're doing them in Manchester and Leeds and other places. Do but, not forget, outside of London also exists and is quite successful in some of this stuff. Uh, as a proud son of Northumberland, I regard you all as terrible Southerners and will happily lecture you on, on, on the provincial interests all afternoon. My point was going to be that the terrible capital um, you know, where, I, where I'm sentenced to spend my life um, yeah, has been you know, a test bed of how, uh, what happens when environmental policy collides with day-to-day -day life in that lots of, lots of the, the low, low traffic network uh, policy has been put in place to basically cut off rat runs like the one outside my house, which I thought was brilliant I mean, for the three weeks it survived until, you know, uh, until a near riot broke out in Wandsworth and the council back then. Um, so I, I, yeah, that, that, but I think, sorry, you are interrupt to, 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 to explain that point. Essentially, the, the, these local level, they, aren't, they, aren't they a good test of the, the retail politics of this in some cases? Well, I think, so I think there's, what do I think? I think, to, A, to, to accept your point, I think there's definitely a potential um, for friction, but I think the, the extent of that friction depends on how much you involve the public and consult with them and level with them, if you like, about the trade-offs and try and work through how you, you know, navigate that. And that's why I think, in a sense, the, the UK Climate Assembly, I think, is a really interesting kind of experiment and, and you know, how you take that forward and, and roll that sort of stuff out on a local level. Because I think just what's instructive from it is that there's a huge amount of support for bold climate action and for behavioural change, but, but it's about sort of working through with people what that looks like. Uh, but the other thing is, I, I think the, the more you delay this, the more disruptive it gets. So it is necessary and it's going to happen. The extent to which it becomes desirable when you really see those benefits, I think in part depends on how fast and, uh, and how far you go, if you like. And I think there's much more that, that politicians can do and central government can do in terms of its relationship with local government, going back to Polly's point, to realise those benefits. So I think the, the case of the offshore wind industry is a good example. Uh, and there's a really live case at the moment, which is the Bifab engineering works in Fife and Lewis. OK, this is this one of the yards is eight miles off the coast of where the, the these wind turbines are going to be installed. And we're at risk at the moment because we there's a lack of industrial strategy more than anything in terms of the Scottish government. But the UK government seemingly won't step in or not yet of losing the contract for eight of the 168 jackets. So I think you're absolutely right, James. If you're saying to, you know, you go up there and talk about green jobs and the potential of green jobs, someone in one of those factories is going to say, we're not realising the benefits. But I think that is within the government's gift about how much it does to ensure that in terms of sector deals, British firms, British workers win some of that, uh, win some of those contracts, if you like. So that's about our industrial strategy and what we do. So we can shape the extent to which the benefits are delivered. But if we're just content to see everything go offshore where it's cheaper and where and where labor standards and regulations uh, are cheaper then you, you're going to get a backlash so i think to, to the extent that it is challenging it's about how you design green policy in part is, it, is, that, green policy. is that green british jobs for green british workers uh, well you might you might snark about it james but the yeah, reality is when people talk ask me i said oh you know which, which do you think are the greenest local uh, local authorities and people will say places like hackney where i live and i'll go no actually in terms of amounts of renewable energy it's grimsby doncaster and warrington now all three of those have got that 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 um uh uh badge for a different reason but Grimsby in particular is because they've got offshore wind right when you're working in offshore wind 
um, and you can see that there are jobs in renewable energy, you're more likely to say, well, I'll have some of that on my roof. Thanks very much. Yeah. Now, it might not be the same technology, but you've already got into the idea that this is fundamentally a good thing which can benefit you and your family. Now, I'm not saying it's completely over overtaken any of the other challenges that that community has, but it does give you an indication of how things work. In Warrington, they've literally, it was the accounts department, it's a finance department in Warrington that worked out that, that building and um, owning a solar farm was going to be a much better way of them generating income that they could then use for other projects within their local, within their borough than other kind of investments. So people can have a big strategic view, either that be, be that through industry or through local authorities, even better if it's both, which can then create a, a, a circumstance and, and, and conditions which build um, public consent and support for what I'm talking about. And that's when I, when I talk about that capacity in the grid, you're going to have much more uptake in places like Bassett Law and the abandoned coal fields where uh, uh, otherwise you're going to have um, left behind communities and de-industrialized areas. If you start offering things which are which put food on the table and give people comfort and, and uh, security, then they can start thinking about opportunity and transforming their own lives. But at the moment, not only with COVID, but also with decades of neglect in those communities, that's what's needed. And the green, and you might say we're being too optimistic about it, but unless we create the conditions of optimism, all we will have is doom. And uh, to be honest, I only get through the day campaigning for, for climate change by thinking about this, because if I thought about the Arctic um, ice cap, I wouldn't be able to manage it. It's far too depressing. That's why we have to get on and do the stuff so that we don't have to worry more about the consequences of, our, of us not doing it. I, 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 as, as, well, as, as Polly knows, others may know, as a, since I'm, I'm a recovering journalist and, uh, and therefore constitutionally given to snark and pessimism, so that's my, <laughs> um, that is that is my my, my role here. Um, thank you. Now, before we go to questions from you know, from our you know, from our audience, I was going to try and bring bring all this back in sort of perfect yeah. loop back to you, Edj, yeah. because um, you know, Matthew was talking about the the political uh, calculate. You know, my sort of sounds like yeah, you know, pejorative term. The, the, the political comes. Considerations in, in in terms of this, you know, the distribution here, and I'm just curious. Yeah, see, you mentioned distribution you know, at the start. From an economist point of view, from a from the committee on climate change perspective, how uh, I mean, do you think there's a difference between an economic analysis of what is the the appropriate distribution, the appropriate way to approach uh, you know, transition? And you know, on the one hand, and a political analysis on the other, and particularly with your with your climate change committee on climate change hat on, how much thought do you have to give to the the political dimensions, you know, small p political dimensions of what you're rec recommending in terms of their legitimacy and their you know, your your recommendations potential to command uh, con you know, consent and respect yeah. from the electorate? Yeah. Um well, actually, one of the most or two of the most popular reports we did recently um, were uh, things that made climate change risks very relevant to different places. And it showed how we're going to be affected around the country differently from climate change risk. Um, one was on coastal uh, erosion and coastal flooding risk, managing the coast in the climate change future, I think. And the other one was on land use planning. Um, now, I don't know whether you'd describe it small p political, but we made a conscious decision in those two reports and going forward in our kind of climate change risk assessment and progress report that will come out in the summer, that we're making conscious decisions to make this risk evidence relevant for people. Um, and I think to make it very clear for people that actually we're not being optimistic when we say we need to spend money on these things and there'll be good good things to spend money on. Um, in fact, we're being very realistic and you might say we're being very pessimistic about the a future that will await us if we don't spend money now. Because every time we say we can't afford to spend on X now, what we're saying effectively is that someone else in future will pay for this. And it's not going to be me, it's not going to be my decision, my business, but someone will. And if we don't take adaptation actions, talking about climate change adaptation, but I think it applies personally, I think it applies to adapting to any risk, any change. If we don't make these assumptions, actions in a systematic way, um, who gets affected, who gets left behind or alone to deal with these risks on their own and who will suffer the most will be the individual 
uh, the households with lower incomes and small businesses or individual businesses who don't have the capacity to deal with some of these risks on their own. We have to do everything together. When you're talking about flood risks in the coastal areas, we have to accept that not everything can be protected. But when we also have to accept that we can't put the whole onus on the individual property level flood risk reduction measures. You have to take a systematic approach. Um, so I think in some ways we're not um, there's, there's, I read somewhere that the um, optimistic writers write uh, unhappy endings because they trust their audiences to readers to find the, the happy messages in the book. And it's the pessimistic writers that write um, happy endings because they don't trust their readers to find the hope. And I think we need both to be um, alarmed by the risks we're facing, but optimistic about our ability to deal with them if we act collectively at a systematic level. Um, so I think with the committee, I don't, we, our job in the adaptation side is, is twofold. One is to, to bring forward the evidence on what the risks are. And as I said, more and more, how different parts of the country are being affected. Um, and we do make some recommendations on, on adaptation actions, but it's not um, our job to, to do adaptation planning for different organizations. But we do also do scrutiny of government as to whether they are undertaking actions that they said they would. Um, and I don't think it's only about, final word on that, it's not only about government spending money, public sector spending money to solve these things. I think it's government leading by example whether it'll be in procurement um, or in the way that they um, uh, they, they regulate um, and they incentivize, there are um, I said there are lots of things things are happening and you know businesses are um, are getting becoming more aware of the the risks that they face um, to their operations or their value chain both in the UK and internationally, um, and um, it, it's also it's also the case that um, I think, sorry, the fairness, the distribution thing that I wanted to come back to actually, um, investing in, in a fair distribution of returns from adaptation to climate change or anything is investing in social capital. Because if you can see that the returns are more equally distributed, then you have more willingness of people to uptake new, take up new ideas um, and more, um, more willingness to, to yeah, comply with regulations um, as well. So I don't think it's like, oh, do we do things efficiently or do we do things in fairly? It's just to be efficient, we need to do things fairly. Thank you. And uh, I just ask one question slightly arises from that, which to, to you, Ajay, and, and to Matthew, and possibly Polly, if, if you want to come in on it. But um, it's, really, it's, about, it's, it's an aspect of the, the distributional uh, issue, I suppose. You mentioned the idea of future costs, because uh, isn't this one of the sort of particular challenges of, of, of climate change policy making and politics, the, the time scale? Um, and we, we know some of the hardest, you know, the hardest bits of politics and policy are essentially when you know, people in Matthew's seat and his colleagues in, in, in Parliament have to make decisions now that may well not have consequences until 10 and 20 and 30 years down the line. Um, so how you, uh, I know there's, there's a lot of economic thinking goes into the, the discounting questions here. Yeah. Um, how, um, how do you, you know, from a research side, how do you factor in that time discounting you know, aspect to, to, to estimating what is fair? Bluntly, how do we work, how do we work out how fair it is for you know, today's population to pay you to to pay for uh, or benefit from things that may you know, that, you know, that may have, may fall on on people in future. Um, and then maybe I can come to you on, on on that question, Matthew. Of essentially, how do I mean how, how do you as a sort of you know, you know, professional you know, you know, politicians are always being accused of short of, of, of short termism and you know thinking only about the next election. How do you how do you think about yeah you know, how do you factor in you know, two and three and five, five electoral cycles down the road into your, your, your into political debate here. But I'll just start with, with, with you, Edgy. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think two, there's two bits to the answer. One is that um, climate change 
is not going to happen as far into the future as we thought it is. We are already, um, you know, in Paris, the agreement was a success and it was saying, oh, we mustn't go beyond two degrees. We're already experiencing one, one and a half degree, and we're already starting to plan for four. Some people are doing it for five degree change. And when this is not in decades and decades time, um, already experiencing some of the impact. The second thing is that you're right, discount, discounting is very <laughs> an important factor. Um, and we heard um, at the weekend that tomorrow we might hear a revision, another revision to Green Book. Uh, and what we heard that in terms of distributing um, the, the returns to um, sort of southeast versus north, where um, I think they rightly, the coverage was that if you keep investing in places that are richer, they will give you higher financial return. Um, and you won't get that if you're not if you're investing in not as rich places. So that's that's not even a kind of fairness agenda that's broadening the kind of benefits you include in your appraisal. So you're not just focusing on financial returns, value in property, in, increase in va property values, but you're also valuing other things that will come with investing in across the country. For discounting, it's almost doing that sort of equal, equalness, fairness analysis, um, efficiency analysis over time. Now, there are three reasons we discount future. One is that um, money resources, not just money, but primarily um, financial capital is limited and we could always do something else with that. So there's a cost of capital argument. There's an argument where that future generations will be wealthier, therefore the additional, the marginal value of things that we can ensure they're getting will be less valued. Um, and the third thing is that we're mortal beings and we're impatient. We want things to happen quickly because we individuals may not live long enough to, to, to see them. But at the government level, um, or even at the big business level or, or businesses that are based in, on land, like forestry, water, agriculture, they are used to thinking about longer term. Um, so the, the, well, they're not as mortal as your, uh, you and I as individuals. Um, but um, what, um, what Green Book 2018 Refresh has done is to reduce the discount rate for health impacts, for example, um, on the basis that we will still value health just as much as we do now, even if we become richer in the future. And I wonder whether there is a potential to do that kind of revision for when it comes to environmental returns or other social returns. We haven't heard that yet, but it might come. Um, who knows? And um, so, but I think there's always been, there's been such a long debate about discounting. Um, and there are even people say, well, we shouldn't discount future at all, um, but we should, the, um, we can't on the one hand say it's our goal to leave the world as we've inherited, at least as good as we've inherited and then discount the benefits of that to the future generations. As with my kind of consultancy hat on, um, a pragmatic approach is always to show to your clients, decision makers, um, as to the implication of discount, different discount rates on the decision. And usually they don't, um, they make a difference in the margin. They don't necessarily make a difference in whether you should do something or not, but um, perhaps a little on the timing, but of course, some, some, some discount, uh, some impact in decisions. So I think it'll be the, the key thing is to be mindful that there are these reasons and and these reasons uh, need revising appraisal and analy analytical approaches needs updating to fit every day you know the times needs um, and it'll be good to to get keep green book under refresh at all times. <laughs> Thank you, um, Matthew. From a, I guess a, a practical politics and policy perspective, how do you? Uh, how can policy here and politics you know, take better account of and, and I come up with, with and answer those questions about who, where do burdens fall between today's population and uh, and, and those who will come after us? Uh, let me try and answer you, James. If you if you don't think I have, you feel free to push back. But but I I mean I suppose what what I'd say I'd make a couple of points. One is that. The price of we've seen the price of, of, of renewable technologies in particular uh, plummet to a degree you know that people did not forecast ten years ago. So there is always that element of uncertainty as to as to as to what happens. 
But I, I think Eze is right in the sense of my starting point is, I suppose, a pragmatic question about, um, and this is, you know, where you sit is where you stand. I'm the climate change minister, so I'm looking at net zero as a sort of mission, if you like. But how do you get there pragmatically in a way that, um, you, you know, allows you to uh, the cost to be as low as possible and the burden to be fairly shifted? And I do think there is a, there's a big discussion still to be had about how we um, how we pay for all this in terms of direct taxation or other means. And that applies to lots and lots of areas of, of, of climate policy, if you like. But I think Ejay's right in the sense that there's a fundamental question about, are we properly accounting for things now? And that is where we come back to the Green Book uh, and, 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 and absolutely the, all the sounds are that we're gonna look at the fact that the Green Book, if you like, discri discriminates or is biased against poor areas. Uh, we're not, it's not clear whether climate action is going to be a specific part of the Green Book overhaul. And it's the same with the National Investment Bank. All the signs are they're going to bring forward a National Investment Bank. How robust, if you like, is the net zero mandate in that bank? You know, how much capitalization are we looking at? Is it going to get public buy-in in other ways, whether it's green ices or whatever? You know, there's lots of questions. But I, I would just, my spot starting point would, would be, are we accounting for everything in the right way and properly uh, building in climate risk to our decision making and I'm not at the moment it doesn't feel like we have certainly having in the private sector it's very welcome what the government are doing in terms of green finance on TCFDs but they're only looking at premium listed companies by 2025 we think you should go further so there's a in a sense of an EJ covered it very very eloquently in terms of how an economist would look at this but I would my starting point would be at the moment we're not accounting for everything properly Yes, there are real distributional questions we've got to grapple with, but my starting point is, you know, you know account for those things properly. Let's look at the amount of, of, of private uh, capital we need to crowd in and how we do that. But the by the government's own admission, I come back to the 10 point package. In the foreword of that 10 point package, it says the government is looking to crowd in 42 billion pounds of private capital over the decade. Again, that is so far short of the net zero investment gap um, that they are, in a sense, conceding they are not willing to do enough to get us to where we need to be in 2030. And that, that, that level of ambition, if you like, is fundamental to, I think, a slight difference of approach in terms of where you need to get there. And that plays in part uh, something we were speaking to before the call is, you know, how are the government and how are backbench Conservative MPs coming into this issue? Is it, about, is it about net zero or is it about other things that I think they're much more attractive to, uh, nature-based solutions, conservation and the like? And that leads you to a, a sort of a very interesting debate about how under threat, as you've said, some of these things are when they get very, very challenging. And that's why I'd always plump for solutions. And I'll finish on this point uh, that sort of avoid political tinkering in the future. We've got a real, real issue coming up with what replaces the EU emissions trading scheme. You know, do you go for a UK standalone ETS? It's, it's got drawbacks, but a carbon emissions tax, which is liable to treasury tinkering, and that becomes, if you like, if you're not careful, a daily mail campaign every year, like the fuel duty escalator, you know, that we can design out some of these things being real, real pressure points. Uh, and people who don't buy into that cosy uh, consensus, if you like, are using them to really, really push back. Can I just briefly just come in on, on this, James? I think it's, it's very really, briefly. I, I, I it will be, be, it will be very briefly. Our, our friends, it's just so. the, pra the practical realities of trans uh, transforming the, that economic analysis that we've heard from Eche through the political lens that Matthew has has um, outlined is ultimately we need to reform off-chem, right? We've got deep uh, and and that decarbonisation, that that offshore wind didn't collapse in terms of costs just by magic. It collapsed because of government intervention. So never underestimate the importance of government intervention to send a signal to the market identify how much money you're going to you're going to invest in order to be able to crowd in the amount of capital we've calculated about five billion will get you 100 billion that was our research with Siemens and look again at where the costs are falling for consumers gas is not is much much cheaper than electricity if we are going to electrify transport and heat that is going to make a lot of people much, much more squeeze in their energy bills unless we rebalance the costs of our electricity and, and, and gas and reflect more truly the carbon price while also helping people with fuel poverty. At the moment, Ofgem is just nowhere near being able to deal with that because they have not been given instruction to tackle it.
but we may come back to that question. No, not, not today. Another day, we, we might come back to that. And, <laughs> and, and you know, I, I, I know you, you, you said carbon price, and Matthew um, very you, you, uh, candidly admitted that there are some questions to come and debates about those sort of you know, the, the, you know, where to find the money for this stuff in terms of tax you know, of tax burdens and where that tax goes. And I, I agree absolutely that that is a future uh, a future topic. If, if I was still a journalist, Matthew, I'd currently turn on you and say, where, where do you think the, the, those costs should be found, and uh, where should the taxes uh, fall? But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to uh, I'm going to go to our um, our attendees to ask if any of them have any questions they would like to uh, to put to you. Now, forgive, forgive me. I'm I'm looking at both my both my um, yeah both my chat panel. Um, yeah, my participant panel and my uh, my Q and A panel, and uh, yeah, as yet, yeah, yeah, everyone's being very shy at the moment. So we, we currently have uh, we currently have, yeah, have have nobody leaping to ask questions. You, you've you've done such a good job of, uh, of preempting and covering um, you know, covering all issues. I will uh, yeah mm -hmm. ask a, yeah ask another question from from my list while uh, yeah, while everyone thinks about the questions they yeah, they might like to put to you, um, which is sort of following on a little from your um yeah you know, from your points um yeah you yeah know, you know, matthew about the you know i guess the potential political fragility of um yeah you know, of, of transition and it's something i would like to put to um to edge as well i just i'm interested in the international experience because uh the last few years we, we we've talked a lot about populism um and the various sort of populist movements that have arisen around the world and it strikes me sometimes that the, the there are in a few cases a sort of environmental dimension to you know, you know, to populist movements particularly I mean, the, the gilets jaunes movement in in france which came about primarily as a effectively a sort of turbocharged form of that that you know, your poly's daily mail campaign against uh, against fuel duty um uh, and I'm just wondering, if all three of you, if there are sort of uh, countries around the world where that you look to in your various fields and you think they're doing this well, uh, and other countries where you're where, where you look and think, well, that's that's that is the example we must avoid. That's a road we shouldn't go down. So, international examples, positive, positive and negative on on, on just transition. I don't know who. Anybody, anybody keen to leap on that first? Matthew, Matthew waved, 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 a, waved a limb at me. You go first. Matthew. I'll kick off, and, and others may agree with whether these are good or bad examples. I think the Gilets jaunes is, 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 a, is a fantastic example of, uh, of where bad green policy, and I would very clearly say it's badly designed green policy, invites a backlash. And it does so precisely because one of the comments from the Gilets jaunes has always stuck in my mind, which is, you're thinking about the end of the world, I'm thinking about the end of the end week. Of the week. Yeah. Um, and that's it. And that's exactly what needs to be addressed. One place I think, uh, and I'm trying to do a lot of thinking about this, call it just transition or just how you embed fairness into into the transition uh, as part of my role. One area I think it's done it very well is Spain. If you look at the model agreement with with how the Spanish regions have dealt with with, with those regions that are fossil fuel dependent in terms of mining and what the amount of investment and what they've directed in terms of government programs to how you can cushion that transition. Uh, and, and retrain people, reskill people. That is a very good example of where there's been a lot of success, a lot of buy-in from, from unions uh, and, and more general input. But I think my understanding is, and, and I stand to be corrected, but in a, to, to a large extent, it was sort of, you know, slightly co-designed with those who are undergoing the transition. Back to Polly's point, which is, you know, pulling levers in Whitehall and telling people how this is going to happen, uh, I think is part of where it starts to go wrong. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, AJ? I think, yeah, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll come in briefly, not necessarily in, name a sort of golden list of countries to watch, <laughs> but, um, but I think what we're observing is that countries that have experienced some of these risks that we're uh, looking at now for the UK uh, longer than us have taken, um, taken some, some steps, like um, obviously flood risk management in in Netherlands is a good example because they have to deal with it on a daily basis um for for centuries um but also uh, there is a global commission on adaptation that um presented an example from Bangladesh about how um, by investing in early warning systems and um risk reduction 
um, both engineering and and system other systematic solutions how bangladesh reduced its death toll from cyclones from sort of thousands to tens over the the sort of two, two three decades so we don't have to wait long long time but we can learn from from those experiences what the committee will publish um next in the summer which will be the climate change risk assessment um, evidence report um, and that will have an international climate change risks um, chapter um, it's really to encourage both to learn from other countries but also realize how dependent uk is um, in terms of its supply chains in terms of its international relations and generally kind of social and political balances in the world um, and that we not only need to actually pay attention to climate change risks and impacts in UK but globally um, and I think if if government and research um, sectors give enough make enough information relevant and available uh, this is also something where businesses should come on board um, and pay attention to their supply chains internationally and make make these risks um, an issue for business sustainability really they don't have to care about environment or anyone else they need to care about their businesses uh, and not not over the very long term even just short and medium term so there's lo lots to collaborate but i don't have a golden list of countries thank you um and can i sort of point out do you have any uh, do you look look to any any countries around the world and look at the sort of the, the the platonic idea, see the platonic ideal of relations between local and uh, local and central government. Probably most countries do it better than we do, don't they? Well, uh, we're actually establishing a network of networks uh, in the in the run up to COP, <laughs> where where we're looking, where we're making connections with in country local leadership networks like our own. Um, uh, for example, the the one in France is is actually gr um, grown in strength because of the crisis around the gilet jaune. So sometimes, again, a political crisis, <laughs> you know, driven by bad policy, makes everybody go, "Oh, do you know what we 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 should do this better?" We can't. I think one of the really important things is you can't for a long time. Um, and this was uh, way back in the in the in um, in the build up to the Climate Change Act and beyond. There has been a, an an um, attempt by some climate campaigners to um, turn climate into a technocratic exercise. Don't worry, don't look. This is really boring. It's all about heat pumps. We'll get back to you when you when we can deliver one. And then wondering why people go, I didn't. Know, this is not what I ordered, right? Um, and then then being really surprised at the pushback. That is that gilet jaune is a really good example of if you don't if you don't develop things with people and understand what people's own aspirations and ambitions are not just individually and as families but dare I say it as communities and for commun communities in place as well as of interest is uh, Matt's point about uh, trade unions this the Spanish example sounds like it's also very much focused it in regions we know that that French network of local leaders committed to uh, tackling air quality has been strengthened by the pushback that they, that happened from the uh, by the gilet jaune to what was imposed nationally it gave them some space to be able to go to the national government and say do you know what maybe next time you could talk to us if you if you're thinking about doing something like that because we've got very little public transport in our rural areas everybody's entirely dependent on their old uh, on their old jalopies and if you think if you're going to make it harder for them to be able to move around then you're completely screwing with the thing that french people really love which is la france profonde and the countryside so just work back from what people really love and work on, on what you can do from there so there's those kind of things that are really important um, and we're hoping that in uh, cop 26 we're going to be able to bring together those local leaders from across the world not just the kind of C40, the high end, you know, London's and Paris's and New York's, but actually the Sunderland's and Swindon's as well, to show that this is this is possible everywhere and is necessary everywhere too. Thank you. Now we have a question in the Q&A panel from Ashley Cook. Now um, I don't know if um, my friends in the shadows want to, can, can we put, can put Ashley on camera so Ashley can ask, uh, sorry, you, you can ask that, you ask the question? Oh, I've got... We have a we have an Ashley panel, but no no face or voice. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Go go, Ashley. We can hear you. <coughs> Just at the time when I start coughing. Apologies. <laughs> um, really. Uh, would the, would the panelists agree that we are just tinkering with embedding green into our core? And we really should have a paradigm shift from the government. And it's my opinion that change requires funding at a level that we really do re require the full support 
especially from multinationals and large businesses to start paying their way as well as the small and not just leave everything down to the individuals um, to get behind what you know and I'm listening to some absolutely fantastic stuff um, from all the panelists but really it's we need business on on, on board completely Thank you, actually. Yeah, sorry, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good. A, we haven't really talked about sort of private private sector actors so far much. So you, both, if, if I just go around, all, all three of you, so quick, Polly's waving first, so you, quick thoughts on, I guess. Yeah, to, no, to, I totally to, agree. To, to pass the question, you yeah. know, the whole paradigm shift, is it enough? I think, I think, the, I think we can guess all your answers to that one, but also what's the, what more uh, of a role should we see from businesses of all size in the, in that shift? Well, basically there are people gagging to invest in green investment, uh, invest in the green projects in this country if we've got the regulatory and policy frameworks right. So that's balled straight back in the government's court. The private sector wants to be able to do this. Um, it's uh, the, its own risks in terms of adaptation and sustainability, because like uh, Eche says, they're looking 10, 20, 30 years out and they're think, looking at floodplains and heat and cooling and the overheating in urban, urban heat islands like much loved cities like London and so forth are just making it really difficult for them. So they want to be able to mitigate their risks. The insurance industry absolutely knows that that, that it's, a, um, it's a it's a structural risk for them there is plenty of money around in the private sector but it needs to be given certainty and a strong sense of direction from national government that is what is required our members work very closely with businesses big corporates to understand each other so that the the, the solutions can be co-designed together but can I say that it's a particular role for local government in supporting small and medium-sized enterprises to be able to uh, to get into uh, the right place in terms of procurement and so forth. When you are running a takeaway, right, or running a small business of 10, 20, 30 people in a pub, you don't, or, or whatever it is, all these kind of organisations and companies have really st uh, struggled through the crisis. Who's then going to uh, be thinking about a sustainable procurement strategy? They're not going to have one. Somebody needs to be able to help them. And who knows their small businesses better than their local authorities? So that, again, is a really key part. I don't think we should think that big business is necessarily a baddie on this. They've got quite a lot of the answers, but they're used to doing things in a global way. When they understand where, where there are some, like, for example, Siemens and others that have worked with us, understand the importance of local, it really can be transformative. And I think, again, the, the, the important thing is government enables that private money to come our way. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, Edge and Matthew, anyone want to go first on, on, the, yeah. on the business question? Yeah, I think it's, it's really crucial to make not only just provide evidence on what the risks are, but actually making it relevant for businesses. So and, and helping them explain that if you got certain goals, those goals will be more difficult to achieve, will be more costly to achieve um, if you ignore some of these risks, the risks that apply to you. I mean, it's a really simple business thing. And what really... Um, triggers business action is the realization that you don't know something. Not knowing the implications of risks for your business is the biggest incentive to move. Then the business can choose not to act, but not knowing is the is the worst. And I think that's what we're trying to, to change. We're trying to make more information available, but more relevantly so. Um, and with my FTEC hat on, I think the, one of the uh, the, what gives me hope is is to see um, movement from businesses saying or movement from finance from the city um, to to say we do need to understand risks better, like the the TCFD. But there's also one called um, the nature related or natural capital related f uh, risks and financial disclosure to do with that TNFD. There's more and more people looking into can we change financial accounting system. Can we have natural capital accounting, for example, where I can see my dependency, my business's dependency on nature, and, and I can see what, what the investments in nature will return to me in short, medium, long term. There's, there are um, farmers are trying to do this more, trying to understand the importance of natural assets like soils, like water in their long term um, survival, but also within a government system, right? So the environmental land management scheme in England or equivalents in Scotland and Wales, 
they're telling people farmers that we're going to pay for public goods well they're now asking questions what are public goods am i providing them can i continue to provide them in the future in climate change risks or any other thing um there's also one example in great and we are in london but let, let me give you a non london example um and greater manchester um in my company as ftech we did the work for them um on looking at all the green assets in the city uh, and they're now working on creating an investment readiness fund to be able to bring in beneficiaries from these green assets um business beneficiaries included into investing in in the up maintain maintenance of the assets so that they could all look after something good and something that they all have a stake in regardless of the kind of legal ownership um and so there are things things happening and um and they are very good very positive science um but there needs to be a systematic um assessment of of the risks and opportunities and leadership from public sector as Polly said to set the regulatory framework in place so people can trust the system and make a move um and not wait for someone else to do someone else to do so thank you um now we've got four minutes left which means i'm going to be very cruel to matthew and i'm going to ask him yeah i need him three minutes and i'd like you matthew start to answer not not just the question that we've just been put about business but what was one very brief thought actually on something that uh arises from something that Edge said at the very start about multidisciplinary research i just wonder what you asked you because the obviously the the theme of the, this event the the ask, the ask the expert events we do at smf is essentially about trying to make sure that social uh, social science and well, the academic research of all sorts has impact on policy and so the the, the closing question i would ask you is um what do you as a policymaker want from research what what's what, what what's the most useful thing for you to get from from the academic and research community in terms of informing your thinking and making a better policy here so if you can try uh, if you can answer that question as well as giving us thoughts on ashley's very good question about the role of business in 100 80 seconds or fewer before we all wrap up. I will be very grateful and uh, in fact, I, will, I will owe you many favours for, for, for your, your in future. So, uh, I'll, try, I'll try and be really quick, James. I think Polly is absolutely right. The, the, I, the private sector is in no way a sort of enemy here. It can be a real ally if we get the right framework in place. And some of that is just regulatory tweaks that we've known about for a long, long time. Alan Whitehead told me once that one of this SI he was taking through on batteries, which was a matter of consensus should have been done a long time ago it took years to get through the parliamentary system we've got to be far faster than that i think there's specific things that government also needs to do in particular on small businesses not enough small businesses get support guidance there's a financing gap there's a skills issue in terms of net zero but they're a huge part of the net zero uh, issue and i think and uh, and this may be what ashley was getting at i think the government can do much more in terms of greening the financial system and the city of london i mean if you look at the fact that you know, the UK is responsible for 1% of territorial emissions, 15% at least of, of, of emissions flow through the city of L companies uh, listed in the city of London. And we can do much more, not just on TCFD, but to do that, and we should do that before COP. But coming back to Ashley's main point, absolutely is systems change. And my sort of worry about the government, if there's any philosophical difference here, I think it's that the government think that with a bit of public investment, uh, the market will sort of do the rest and we can put a punt on a few emerging technologies and they'll help us at the end of the day down the road. And I think it's much more about being very, very honest about the scale of the challenge and, and getting people involved in that conversation. Uh, what is a really difficult question, James, your last one in terms of what, what do we want from social scientists? I mean, I think there's, there is, there is a, an abundance of uh, analysis going on out there about what can be done. What's most useful, I think, is, is that really the practical scenario planning, if you like, about how, you know, what is the best way to kind of meet these goals that we're talking about um, and, and that have real world, that have real world kind of implications and lessons for, from them, if you like. So, you know, Polly's absolutely right that the, the Spanish example on just transition is very re region based, mm. but those regional examples and countrywide examples are really interesting for, from an, from a, you know what's going on around the rest of the world but just like Polly's doing in terms of of local areas in this country everyone is facing this challenge around the world and we've got to get to net zero at different speeds and dates 2050 is very much too late for us in my view but we there's a lot to learn in terms of what goes out on in the rest of the world I don't think we do that that particularly well if you like um 
And I think as a broader point, our links with the rest of the world and parliamentarians are with, around the rest of the world in terms of climate have really, to, to a surprising degree, I think broken down over recent years and just aren't there. And going into COP, that's I think something that, you know, is a very obvious thing we could address. Thank you very much. You, you've, you've risen very well to my, my very unfair challenge to do all that in a short period of time um, uh, and brought us very neatly to 3.15, which is our allotted uh, end time. So all I'm, all I'm going to do now, because you definitely heard too much of me for the last hour and a quarter, is to uh, say thank, well, thank everyone for coming. Say thank you very much to uh, UKRI, uh, UK Research and Innovation, for making this all possible. Uh, and thank you all very much, our panellists, Polly Billington, Matthew Pennycook, uh, especially uh, Edgy uh, uh, Osdem Royal. Thank you all very much. Um, and we'll look out for your um, next outputs, particularly the Committee on Climate Change report uh, early next month uh, on our next steps. So thank you all. Hope to see you at the, uh, the SMF again soon. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much.